So welcome everyone to episode number 49. And um, as you probably gathered already, uh, Craig and our guest Peter are in the same room, at opposite ends of the room in Niagara Falls at the um, Canadian Federation of Podiatric Medicine annual conference. And um, it's a bit later in the UK. It's 10 p.m. now because of the Canadian time difference. I was feeling a bit hard done by having to do this from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. and I've got a 5 a.m. start tomorrow. But our guest Peter has just come off the back of four hours straight lecturing straight into this. So, um, Peter, thanks for joining us and thank you so much for uh, you know being so mentally fatigued and still still accepting our, our invitation. And we're looking forward to talking about. I guess what you've been talking about for the last four hours, just, just another hour to go for you. And that is foot orthoses and, and the modifications we make um, chair side or in, in clinic based on prescription variables, presenting pathologies, and of course, tolerance issues. So um, perhaps we could kick off with, and I know Craig was in your workshop as well, but just giving us a bit of a, a feel for how the workshop went, some of the key things you discussed, and then we'll sort of unpick them in more detail uh, here. Sure. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Yep. Perfect. Um, a little bit of a time lag here. Oops, what's... Okay, you can hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear yep. you. Okay. Yeah, yep. Yep, sorry. Just, yeah, just go ahead. Okay, um, yeah, I've been uh, lecturing since about one o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time here in Niagara Falls. And uh, uh, the way that my uh, lecture progressed was I had about six topics that uh, my uh, uh, lecture group could uh, choose from. Uh, anything from the podiatric significance of tissue stress therapy, uh, tissue stress theory, to how uh, the inside of an orthotic lab works and some of the issues inside an orthotic lab and uh, how you as a practitioner can minimize some of the errors that you make and minimize some of the errors that occur within the orthotic lab. Um, we also uh, touched upon some of the physical examination techniques that you can use, especially related to tissue stress therapy lot of functional testing uh, that we covered. Um, there was another section that I wanted to talk about but just didn't have enough time. Uh, it was how orthotics work and uh, anything from mechanical to non-mechanical so I just have to leave that for another day. But uh, one that uh, we had to leave to the very very end was the orthotic modification matrix and uh, this is something that I've been working on for years. In fact, I talked about this in May in the 24-hour dietary fireside uh, chat live, um, which was, uh, I think, well-received um, based on some feedback I received. Um, so I'm hoping that it'll be the same today. It will, I'm sure. And, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it myself more. Am I right in saying this is something that you have developed yourself over many, many years of practice. You've been practicing for, I think I read somewhere, 33 years. Is, is that an accurate yes. number? Meaning that I was, yes. I was a seven-year-old boy when you started doing this for a living. So there's a, you know, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing this thing that you've, you've developed over such a long career and, um, and getting some tips uh, myself as well. Is it mostly the modification of devices that haven't been well received or is it, it, it does it sort of feed into the the sort of manufacture of chair side devices the first time you meet someone um it's a combination of uh, both um it's the prescription the first time around and what you decide to go into the prescription and when the device comes back after the patient has worn it for a while and how you're able to modify it to hopefully reduce some of the loads and the tissues that the patients are complaining about. And this is something uh, that uh, I've worked on for a number of years uh, based on the information that's come back through research and basically just a gut feel when you're with the patient at the point in time and you're hoping to reduce um, the symptoms that they're complaining about and hopefully align it to Lows that are being applied to the tissues. 
super. I think it's a, I think it's a brilliant thing that will be welcomed by, by many because we all agree that this is the easiest job in the world when you're giving people devices and they're getting better and they, they're not coming back complaining. It feels like the easiest job in the world. And those tough days in clinic are the ones where people come back with, with tolerance issues, comfort issues, niggles, complaints. Um, you may, uh, one of the questions that came in beforehand, it seems like a pertinent time to ask it and, and you may well say that the, the matrix will answer this, but what are the most common sort of complaints that you have experienced over your career with people that come back with devices and, and they're not doing so well with them? Well, a lot of the times you're hoping to reduce lows on the tissues and sometimes you might over, uh, might over, uh, you might put too much stiffness in the device and sometimes you've got to push back. So whether it's not understanding how the lab is, labs, um, first of all, you have to understand how the lab modifies their orthotic device. So cast modifications and what they're doing. And if you can understand what your lab is doing, then you can sometimes alleviate or avoid some of those uh, mistakes. So um, sometimes uh, the difference between no fill in the arch to maximum fill in the arch and not understanding what your lab is providing you. And once you understand what the lab provides you, and you understand the weight of the patient and the activity levels that they're doing, then you can match the stiffness of the device to uh, what the patient is um, going through on a daily basis, whether they're a runner, whether they're working in a factory, whether they're just standing. So you have to understand the activity levels of the patient. Hopefully you can um, apply the right amount of stiffness to the device to limit the loads on the tissues. And I find that can be sometimes very, very easy or sometimes very, very difficult. Yeah, absolutely. And um, maybe, maybe now's a good time, Craig, you've seen it before. So do you think now's a good time to just pull up the matrix and, and talk yeah, through like, it? Yeah, like, yeah, just, yeah, just pick up, yeah, um, yeah, if you want to just share your screen, Peter, and then we can um, pick on whichever one, perhaps you want to pick one first, Ian, and if anyone wants to make it one in the comments, uh, what they would like. Is there a share? Sorry, Craig, is there a share button on the screen here somewhere? Because I'm not I'll seeing just, it. I'll just come around. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's what I should. Okay. There we go. It's actually that one there. There we go. There's the orthotic modification screen. Sorry about that, Craig. He's getting his uh, exercise in here today. Yeah, yeah, for those that have joined late, obviously Peter and I are in the same room. So you just give us a wave, Peter. <laughs> Where is Craig? <laughs> right, so, so, um, so where should we start, know, where Craig? I tell you what, can I pick? Can I pick one? I've just had a glance over it. Let's talk. Let's go to the to the occupational situation column and, and talk about uh, patients who must stand for lengthy periods. We all see these patients. They're they're university lecturers. They're hairdressers. They're you know personal trainers and you know factory workers. That seems like a pretty good place to start to me. Sure. Um. This is actually, I typically have aimed this towards the factory worker, standing in one place, not too much movement. And I've, you know, I go between the thermoplastic devices or modification, almost like a tri-density device that a diabetic patient has. So this is a lab that I utilize for uh, situations. So this is kind of a, a EVA puff top cover um, with, um, some poron that's sandwiched in blue between two densities of EVA. And, and actually, sometimes I think it's like an overcork material. And on the very, very bottom one, which is uh, very, very fuzzy, that's actually a black plastic boat um, material. And we have poron sandwiched between overcork type of material. So basically, what happens is the poron uh, actually acts like a, a spring within the orthotic device. And I can actually have it very, very firm or not so firm based on the demands on the tissues and those on the tissues. 
And I find this very, very, very successful in patients who wear boots and who are uh, standing in one place for a long, long period of time. I've had hit and miss with you know, polypropylene uh, devices with um, maybe uh, arch fill of uh, poron or um, some type of soft EVA, but I find these tri-density devices uh, work quite well in this uh, category. Super. Could we go back to the matrix, uh, please? Yeah. Let me see if I can... Okay, back to the matrix. We're in the matrix. I like it. Um, so I'm going to pick another one, if that's okay, Craig. Um, sure. it's, it's my least favorite thing. Uh, it's my least favorite thing to... Oh, it's gone. Technical difficulties. I'm glad you're both in the same room. This would be really awkward if Craig was in Australia and you were in Canada. But... Oh, I know. This would be very, very hard. <laughs> there we go. So this is a little bit better. I'm going to put this screen on here. There we go. Is that better? Perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Um, I might go ahead and pick another one, Craig, if you don't mind. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I know that means I get two goes in a row, but the other one I want to make sure that we cover because it's my least favorite thing to see in the world, and that is the, the dreaded uh, Morton's or intermetatarsal neuroma. So can we click on um, Morton's neuroma modification there, so the bottom middle? Sure. This is something that I've used. Um, I saw it the first time in the uh, Journal of American Pediatric Medical Association. And when you have that uh, three, four in a metatarsal space in aroma and you've tried everything else, sometimes just putting a, um, I guess this is a dorsiflexion force underneath the fourth and fifth uh, metatarsals, sometime, sometimes does release some of that uh, intermetatarsal shaft. Uh, stress on the neuroma. It works in about 50% of the patients, but I found that when I have used it, it's, it's actually worked. And uh, otherwise, you're looking at uh, some of the other modifications uh, for uh, the neuroma, which would be like the PMP, which I don't find works all that well often. Um, and um, sometimes I even see a very, very thin, think of it like a thin shaft pad that is either on metatarsal shaft four or actually in between three and four. And I haven't really found very much uh, success with that. And I found more success with uh, this modification on the device. And this isn't something that I would ask the lab to do. This would be something that I would apply myself in office and uh, see whether or not it would help with the Good stuff. We just had a question come in from a friend of the show, Ian Riley, and he's asked, do you scan the size of the uh, intermetatarsal neuroma before you decide on this? Um, I, I usually what happens in my case is if it doesn't work uh, right off the bat, then I will send diagnostic ultrasound to see what I am dealing with and the size of it. Um, and I think Ian, he's also into uh, injections uh, for Morton's aroma. And uh, am I correct on that? I'm not he's sure. into, I think he's into injections for everything, if I'm honest. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. I'm I know Ian was here at the <laughs> conference, so that's, I just wanted to make sure it was the same Ian. Um, I will do an injection, um, but I will do this modification first before I do the injection. Does that answer his question? Yeah, I think so. He's not, he's not messaged otherwise, so I'll let you know if he messages again. Um, I should say uh, to anyone watching, if, uh, Peter, if you might, don't mind going back to your matrix, and, and to anyone watching, if, you, if there's anything on the matrix that you see there that you think, like I just did with the neuroma, you see there and you think, oh, yeah, I want to make sure that we cover that, then, then drop it in the comments and we'll make sure uh, that we go through it. Um, anything there, Craig, that you want to well, choose? Actually, mate, mate, why don't we just, I, I had a question for Peter, not related to the matrix. Let's just leave the matrix up for a few moments. So perhaps people okay. can have a look at it, make a decision and 
I mean, Peter, Peter this is a question with notice, because I, I did talk to Peter about it beforehand, and that was a, about having a grinder in your clinic. And I, I'm always amazed how many clinics don't have grinders. And I, 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 I don't know my stats, but I, my best guess is at least half of prefabricated and custom-made orthotics I use, I use the grinder on. I, I do something to it. <laughs> um, so I just thought if you'd comment on that, and perhaps Ian might want to comment as well. I, <laughs> well, my opinion on not having a grinder in is I think it, it uh, takes away from uh, patient satisfaction. Um, I think from a patient satisfaction standpoint, your ability to modify an orthotic on the spot and give it back to the patient and they can see the difference right away, good or bad, is a good thing because otherwise you have to sit in the lab, wait a week, and then bring the patient back. And I don't think they're gonna to be too happy with not having whatever orthotic device that you prescribe for them, uh, not for that, that time period. So just from a patient satisfaction standpoint, I think it's just a good idea to have an orthotic uh, grinder in the office. And then when you do have the orthotic grinder in there, you have a whole world of opportunities or a world of opportunity that opens up to you and you can you can do a lot more things. Uh, I tend to do a lot more vision accommodations when I have a grind or I can do more uh, forefoot um, modifications to my orthotic device or do arch fill. So it, it just it just adds a lot more uh, into your toolbox that you would not otherwise have if you had to send the orthotic the patients are just happy. That's just my kind of bias and opinion. Yeah, no, I, uh, I share that. I yeah. share that. We have we have grinders in almost every work, every clinic I work in. But one of the practices I work in um, that I sort of oversee the podiatry service for, we now we've just expanded from four clinics to seven. So three of them don't have grinders. And one of the sort of managers came to me recently and said, "Do we need a grinder in every clinic?" And and, and my, my argument was absolutely that we that we absolutely do. So yeah, I totally. There's nothing I disagree with that I've heard there. Um, there's been a grinder joke uh, by Ian Riley that I suspect. Uh, I don't know whether it's a universal Canadian Australia joke, but this is what happens when we do a show at ten o'clock. It just seems like everyone's a bit looser in the comments than, than they normally are. So hey, that's, that's good. Let's move on. Um, I had a question as well. It's not about the matrix, but we'll, we'll leave it up there so that people can still look at it. And that is the, one of the most common complaints, certainly uh, early in my career, um, and I still get them now and then, is with regard to comfort and tolerance, is that they just feel like it's that, you know, that classic lump in the arch or golf ball in the arch. And I remember years and years ago speaking to Craig about this, and I don't know if you remember saying this, Craig, or whether you still believe it, but you used to just add a heel raise to them. And I think you used to say that about 80% of them reported it was much more comfortable, uh, is it, if I've remembered that correctly. Um, do you have any sort of uh, tips for that, that pretty common sort of tolerance issue and how we can modify something in clinic there and then to sort of improve their comfort, Peter? Well, I think... Uh, the first and foremost thing is, have you taken a good cast? So if you've taken a good cast and you've evaluated and everything is good on that standpoint and the lab is happy with what you have, then I think a lot of the problems go away. But with respect to the arch irritation, um, you know, is it also because maybe, the lab, maybe you want a minimum fill in the arch area and maybe the patient can't tolerate that. So maybe you have to cut back to a medium arch fill or a maximum arch fill. So it's basically the cast modification that the lab does. So it could be in that area there. Um, the other option with the heel raise that you talked about, um, if there's an equinus influence on yeah, the heel so. which you haven't identified, then that is gonna be, the brunt of that is gonna be taken by the midtarsal joint because it wants to bend because of the equinus influence. So if you haven't uh, identified that, then by all means, a heel rise would be a perfect way to get around that Aquinas influence. And also too, um, is your first MPJ dorsiflexing enough for the windlass to work properly? So I, I think it's kind of like a sagittal plane type of problem that maybe uh, you need to evaluate to see whether or not uh, that takes away from the arch irritation. Because otherwise, um, a lot of the times it can be just a cast error on your part 
that you may have done a cast error and uh, just you know thrown in a, a supinatus that you didn't reduce and a number of other things that could come into the cast. So I, I assume that a good cast has been taken and then once a good cast has been taken, the Aquinas influence and then and whether or not the windless mechanism is working. So that's kind of my take on that. So those would be kind of like the sagittal plane. Yeah. I think problems. I think I think my comment in about that was the you've got a plastic orthotic you've got some arch irritation typically what you want to do about it is heat the plastic up and perhaps move it away from the arch a little bit yeah. that's bloody hard it's difficult oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'd rather not do that so if you, you if you've got tight calf muscles and that's what's collapsing the mid tarsal joint into this rigid orthotic well, you had a heel race and see if that takes it away first. And it's amazing how often it did, it, it did that. If it didn't, you then resort to getting out the heat gun and trying to change the shape of the plastic. And, you know, if you don't change it correctly, you've got to change it again. And then next thing you're going to have to get the orthotics remade. So um, a heel race is often my first approach, that arch irritation. Um, and then perhaps, well, hopefully, as Peter said, getting the cast right first. Yeah, I think the cast probably key, which is probably why we tend to find it's something that really bothers us in our early careers, but perhaps much less so, certainly much less so uh, more recently. You'd like to think you'd, uh, you're getting better at casting people. No one's asked for another um, yeah. a- another thing off the matrix. Yeah, yet, Peter, actually, so. yeah, maybe for those that are watching live, that you know, we've left the matrix up for anyone to pick something they want us to talk about. But maybe, Peter, what about the John Weed or Ritchie wedge for load on the plantar fascia? That's probably, I know what it is, but it's not a terminology that I don't think many people would actually use. Sure. Uh, this stems back to the days when uh, there, you know, was the kind of the root protocol of uh, doing uh, thermoplastic devices. So uh, this was something that was uh, originated by John Weed, and it was in office this modification is basically trying to solve an orthosis that wasn't providing enough valgus correction as important in the forefoot. So maybe what might have happened, there might have been a forefoot supinatus that wasn't corrected possibly. And uh, uh, generally what happened was, is I guess if you put that valgus uh, uh, modification into the top of the three-quarter device, it would actually evert the forefoot and in actual fact, take strain off of the plantar fascia. So this is uh, some, some pictures that I uh, got off of Jeffrey, who uh, is at Root Orthotic Labs. And, and actually, I asked him to do this because he hasn't had to do this type of uh, modification in years and years. Uh, and this is something that was commonly done back in the 70s and 80s um, to help to salvage an orthotic device. And uh, the... Uh, other device uh, or the other modification is the Ritchie wedgie, which is basically the same thing. It's got thickness uh, underneath the fifth uh, metatarsal head and is actually skived or beveled uh, backwards towards the fifth metatarsal shaft and then beveled from lateral to medial toward the first metatarsal. And pretty much it's doing the same thing. It's, it's causing a valgus force in the forefoot. And Generally, what it's doing is it's actually taking stress off of the plantar fascia, and it's based on this article uh, done by uh, Safarian, uh, and he tried to explain the Safarian twisted plate. And uh, generally, if you look at the pictures, you'll see that when you look at the distance between one end of the twisted plate and the end of the twisted plate, uh, there are varying uh, lengths depending on the position of the actual, so they have one end of the twisted plate that's vertical to represent a vertical heel. And then if you look at the very first uh, diagram, you'll see a very, very flat uh, forefoot. So that's kind of like a perpendicular uh, heel to forefoot. And then the untwisting would represent a rear foot everted forefoot supinated. So this is where you might not have uh, reduced the forefoot supinatus. And then when you put the valgus uh, modification in, basically you're twisting the uh, rear foot in relation to the forefoot. And that, in theory, reduces the distance of the plantar fascia from the heel to the forefoot. And that's based on a cadaver study that was done by Kogler. And uh, they looked at lateral foot regis 
uh, to reduce strain on the plantar fascia. And they found that the uh, cadaver situations where they had the uh, four foot valgus type uh, wedges in actually reduced the strain on the plantar fascia the most. And that was the sort of the idea behind these modifications that is kind of like a stop gap to help to take some stress off of the plantar fascia and may even reduce some of the strain on the plantar fascia in cases where you have uh, plantar fasciitis or plantar fasciosis or whatever the terminology is now. <laughs> That's superb actually because one of the questions that, that someone emailed in before the show was about sort of tips for pathology pathology specific prescribing and they use plantar fasciopathy as, as, as an example and um, uh, I think that's a great a great example of it the sort of uh, where well, I guess you, the four foot valgus wedge or I, I must admit I've never heard uh, of it described as a richy wedgy before that's new terminology on me but I guess they're all trying to achieve something very similar uh, mechanic mechanically speaking aren't they well um, I'll give you a, a, another example um, when I went to school, uh, graduated in 85, a lot of my professors were actually from the Edinburgh School of uh, Podiatry. I guess, I, I'm not sure if that's if that in, uh, the, I don't know what the university is called now, but when we were in biomechanics, we used to get contralateral wedges. So you would have a medial wedge and then a forefoot wedge, and that's what it was called, a contralateral wedge on an insole. And pretty much this is the same thing is basically inverting the rear foot and everting the forefoot and taking strain off the plantar fascia. So this is a concept that's been around, I think, at least since the 1930s, probably. Maybe before that. No, I, I have a paper by Steinler from 1890-something, and he's an orthopedic surgeon, and his, his approach to treating the pediatric flat foot was to put uh, on the outside of a shoe a medial heel wedge and a lateral forefoot wedge, and he called that yeah. untwisting the flat foot. That was 1890. Yes. So we still haven't come very far. <laughs> no. no and, it, and it does work. <laughs> <laughs> um, I might pick another thing off the matrix. Uh, I know I'm being greedy. It's my third one, but no one else has come forward and asked for one. And it's it's yeah. a group of people I see. Like, I see a lot of professional rugby players. So it's the... It's the top one on the second row from the right top. Occupational situations, increased forefoot pressure from kneeling or squatting. We see this a lot in um, we see this a lot in front rowers and, and anyone scrummaging. So um, I'd love to see that one, please. Uh, so basically, jobs that involve kneeling, stooping, or squatting require basically the proximal transfer of pressure off the metatarsal heads. So any way that you can take pressure off of the metatarsal heads and put it back into the arch area would be helpful. Now, obviously, the situation that you see here is probably kind of the worst case scenario where somebody is in an uneven surface and a curved surface and they're sitting like that all day. So it may not just be orthotic devices. It may even be something that you might use like a silicone orthodigital underneath the toes to provide more of a platform for the toes in a situation where, uh, for instance, let's say the toes were buckling and they were clawing or in a hammer toe position, anything that can actually help put a little bit of offloading in the forefoot, anything would help. So I would think that sometimes you, you're definitely going to have to have a full length orthotic device. There's probably going to have to be a lot of cushioning and you might have to also uh, consider what your um, digits are doing. And not only that, if you have access to in shoe pressure measurement system, whether it's an F-scan or emet pedar, um, you might even want to try that if you have that available and see whether or not there's some things that you can do, kind of like as a test retest type of orthotic using in shoe pressure measurement. And you might be able to find a way to take some stresses off the forefoot. So that's just a little bit of advice that I would give to the uh, people in, uh, yeah. in listening. I mean, ultimately, incredibly challenging if that's the position they're in for their career. Um, I mean, really, got to try and change that if you can. Is that is that a reasonable comment? Oh yeah, yeah. You got to yeah. try to find a way to reduce the loads in the forefoot. Maybe they can alter the way that they're doing this. Um, 
but you know, it, there's a little bit of give and take between um, the patient and you. And what I was talking about today, and this is something that is a new concept I brought to the crowd, was the aspect of uh, acute versus chronic workload. And I think patients, if you can explain that, it all comes from the athletic world with athletes and how the acute versus chronic workload ratio works. But I think you can apply this to occupations too. And you get patients to realize you're doing certain things where you're putting a chronic workload on and married for week upon week upon week. And then you try some new activity and you spike your, your workload in that area. And I, I think as long as they understand that, maybe they can try different kneeling positions, different things to help to offload the tissues. And I think if you can educate them on that, that might be helpful also too. Can, Great. Can you just unshare your screen for a moment, Peter? I'll just share mine. I'll just put something up. Um, just on that topic, I don't know whether anyone saw this a couple of weeks ago. It was from the American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Surgeons meeting, called, a thing called Computer Foot. And it's about sitting at the computer with your feet in this position. And what they showed was that it, well, what they found was a quarter of the patients with what they called metatarsalgia sat yes. this way. Um, so yeah, so it's just called yeah, computer foot, another new condition. <laughs> hey, I'm not even on a computer right now. Well, actually I am, and I'm doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just had to check my feet and I was doing it too. I like these terms, <laughs> computer foot though. I remember a couple of years ago when they, when they referred to, uh, kids playing consoles too much as nintenditis and i've always enjoyed that i think that phrase is one of my favorites um peter could you just share your screen with the matrix again just sure. i've got i've got a question that's not about that but i just want to make sure it's on the screen so that anyone who's watching um can glance at it and and, and anyone who's joined us since we last said this peter's got this this matrix and if you have a scan over it while we're chatting um if there's anything on there you want you, you want us to click on and go into and talk about a bit more um please do but while while, while everyone's looking at that um i had a question about it's another, another question about um things we do in clinic if things aren't going so well uh, i know i've got a lot of those it seems like i'm not a very good clinician i'm sure to you but um, you know i promise that's not the case um that balance that we have between wanting to prescribe something, having a prescription variables in our mind that we think are the most appropriate to, to, to get the job done, whatever the job may be. And of course, the, the patient's tolerance and comfort. And we know if we're going to give a really extreme example, something that we could make something incredibly comfortable that probably doesn't achieve what we want it to mechanically, at least. Or we could make something that definitely achieves our goals that would be very poorly tolerated. And we're looking for this this sort of uh, magical zone in the middle. And, and I just wondered if you could give us some tips as to how to, how to broach that, how to sort of um, make sure there are no big trade-offs and how to titrate those, those sort of clinical scenarios. Well, uh, one of the studies that I've been really excited about, um, and I, I didn't get a chance to mention it today, and I'm sure you guys are well aware of it, is that study, I guess, that was done in Scotland. I think it's Teffler. And he talked about the dose response of CAD CAM orthotics from lateral posting to medial posting. And the interesting thing was, is the increase in kinematic or kinetic, kinetic effect, and even EMG effect, and actually plantar pressures also too. I mean, I know it was a small sample size, but you could see where if you kept adding medial posting in the rear foot, there was more and more of an effect. So, I think there's a lot of people who are willing to stick in the heel stabilizer zero, you know, wedging category, and they're not willing to go to say a medial heel or sorry, uh, uh, a medial heel sky or an inverted type orthotic, which will probably take a little bit more stress off the loads. I mean, what they're probably doing is helping, but it probably could be much more helpful if they were willing to up their um, orthotic prescription variables, whether it be more of a heel sky, more of an inverted orthotic, more of a medial flange, especially if you're trying to resupinate the foot along the Taylor joint 
Texas, but there are a lot of practitioners who are afraid to do those type of things. And I can understand why, you know, they might have some, uh, you know, they just don't feel right about it. So one of the things I talked about today, especially with, uh, with regards to a heel, uh, medial, Kirby medial heel scab was is sometimes you can just put a little bit of felt on the medial aspect of the medial uh, heel count or the medial cup and actually you get the same effect of getting that uh, medial uh, load on the medial side of the foot and hopefully invert and cause a supination moment so to be reduced in the internal uh, muscles like the tibialis posterior. So um, I think a lot of people are, are under prescribing. I know if there's casting errors, the labs will by default you know, under prescribed to make the shelf feel more comfortable. But if you take a good cast and you're willing to offload whatever structure that needs to be offload, you got to give it a shot and see what happens. But I think a lot of people are probably a little bit of uncomfortable to add a little bit more of a prescription variable to get the job done. That's and, my take. No, it's great. And last, last sort of, I guess, sub question to that. How many, um, how many modifications, how many tweaks and changes would you do with a particular patient who is still reporting troubles and, and poor tolerance and discomfort? How many would you do before you got to a point where you felt, okay, this, this, this isn't going well, this, perhaps this person isn't a good candidate for devices? Uh, I'd say on average is about three or four modifications. And then what I tend to do is I recast the patient, take another look at it. Um, I'll either go, um, um, I'll take down the thickness of the dice. So let's say I use four millimeter polypropylene. I'll go down to three millimeter polypropylene and maybe use a bit of an arch fill and see how the patient tolerates that or completely change materials altogether. Maybe go to one of those tri-density devices. Usually in cases of plantar fasciitis where I'm having trouble and I tried all the things and sometimes maybe I just have to go to a more, uh, a less stiff device and hope for the best. But um, sometimes I've gone the opposite where I've actually increased the um, prescription variables and gone the other way. But yeah, it's usually about three or four modifications and if I'm not happy with it, sometimes I'll recast. I, I work with a really, really good lab and I've been using them long enough that if I send back a you know a cast or an orthotic they must know something's really bad that's going on so um, it really depends on the lab they're using in your comfort zone with using your lab and their willingness to take an orthotic back yeah i don't know if that well, helps but it does great and, and as craig always used to say if, if things aren't going well after three or four just refer them to your enemies that's one of craig my favorite sayings of craig <laughs> um I've, we've had a few people ask for some requests off your matrix, so we'll go through those if you may. Uh, Mr. John Gallagher has said he would love to know what uh, you have to say about the capsulitis uh, plantar plate injury um, link. Sure. Uh, this is something that I know Kevin Kirby's talked about, but I was doing this even before he talked about it in his books. Um, and actually, Peter, Peter uh, Kevin's actually watching at the moment. Oh, is he watching? <laughs> he, said, okay. he, said, he said hello. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is he saying hello? Hi, Kevin. How are you doing? Um, I was doing this even before then. Um, when I went to school, we used to do insoles inside of shoes. So we would use re regenerated leather and we would do a lot of uh, capsulitis uh, type patients. So we tended to put on either a pour on. Um, PMP or plantar cover and we would view it to whatever area um, and generally what I tend to do now is um, I ask the lab um, can you leave the top cover off the device so they pre-glue the top cover it's usually full length I also get them to pre-glue the shell and the Corex edition and then what I'll ask is I will put my own top cover on when the patient has actually uh, I'll, I'll put a little bit of lipstick on the area where the capsulitis is, or even if it's a lesion accommodation, I'll get them to walk with the device inside the shoe without the top cover. The arrow will be marked on the Corex. I'll cut it out and I'll get the patient to walk back on it without the top cover and see if it's in the right spot. 
Sometimes what I'll even do is if you look down and see the channel type padding, sometimes I'll even add more uh, Corex on the lateral side and the medial side. And what I'll also do is I'll ask the patient to go up on their tippy toes just to see if it takes away the pressure away from the area where I've made the cutout. And then once I'm happy with that, then I use my heat gun and I activate the glue on the shell and activate the glue on the top cover. And I will actually put the top cover back on. And sometimes I'll even go as far as putting in a little bit of Coron or PPT in the area where I've actually cut out the Corex. And it just gives a little bit more cushioning and, and comfort to the patient. And that's what I do with capsulitis capsulatus or, or a plantar plant or plantar plate injuries. Yeah, situation. So just on the, the terminology, Peter, you, you talked about Corex. That's something that I'm pretty sure most people in Australia have no idea what it is, but it's a cork-like material. But we, we just tend to use a whole lot of different density EVAs. Okay. Instead of things like Corex or cork. But yeah, it's the it's, it's same, same effect. I mean, it doesn't matter what you use. It's getting the, the effect you want. Yeah, there's a little bit of a cushioning component to Corex, which I like. Um, but yeah, you can use EVA. i even actually, believe it or not, in worst case scenarios where I find that the material that I'm using to accommodate the lesion just bottoms out too fast or thins out too fast, I will actually use EVA, almost like a sewing type of material, a harder durometer, almost like 50 or 60 on some patient situations. And that works really, really, really well. Um, I'll even put a little bit of pour on in the, either the channel or the area where I cut out the U and uh, that works really, really great. And Peter, would you use this sort of modification completely in isolation? I know several people who will often sort of combine it with some sort of digital plant flexion taping um, at the same time. Is, it, is that something that you find you have to do? Yeah, actually, I was actually going to state, I also use a lot of uh, uh, silicone orthodigital type appliances um, and, you know, I might do a two to four uh, planter prop, um, you know, that goes between the fourth and the fifth toe and the first and the second inner space and allow the digits to uh, become a little bit more stable. And that actually takes a little bit of pressure off of the uh, second metatarsal phalangeal joint area if there is any calcitonitis. I find that works really, really well. Super. We have had another request um, from your matrix. Uh, I knew the board would, would think, you know, Oh, actually, can I add one more thing? Oh, yeah, of course. Sorry. Of course. Um, if you cannot perform an in-office modification and you need to offload an area of high pressure, this was a little bit of a tip I got from one of the lab owners is, is that you could actually ask the uh, top cover to be plasizo on top of the orthotic device, and you could get the patient to wear it for a week or two, and then the actual area of pressure will be in the area where the depression of the port or the plastic will be, and then you can send it back to the lab, and then they can make the modification for the uh, capsulitis or the plantar plate. It's just if you just can't do the modification in the office. So that's for people who don't have a grinder in their office. Yeah, that's a nice tip as well to see you know where the high pressure is. That's a good yeah, I like that. Um, so back to the matrix. Mark Mark Waldron has has asked. Um, if you could click on your link for, I can't see it myself here, but I think there's a link for high heeled shoes somewhere, which I guess is, uh, I think, oh yeah, it's in occupational situations, second from bottom. I guess it's something that all of us have, have discussed with someone at, at some point or another. Well, I have to say, I, I don't really like doing this. Um, <laughs> I have to do it. Um, this is about the only device that I will actually do. Um, in fact, I was showing it at the uh, conference today. This is a lab that I use. In fact, I particularly use one lab a lot, but I use three or four other labs for specialized devices. Uh, and this is one device that I will use in a high heel shoe. Um, it's made out of a material called polyethylene. And um, we call this the micro fit device. You can even see there's like a parabola to the uh, forefoot there. And actually, that arch is really, really high. So depending on the um, arch profile of the patient, it will come right up into the arch. So I tend to cast the patient and I also send the high heel to the lab with the cast. 
so that the lab sees the heel to toe progression so that they can properly fit the uh, dress shoe device into the high heel. And there sometimes will be a sulcus, um, uh, you know, sulcus padding extended from the metatarsal parabola to where the sulcus ends, uh, just to give a little bit of cushioning in the forefoot area. I don't really like using this device, but if I have to do it, a lot of patients are quite happy with it. Yeah, perfect. We had a question just now from, from Toby saying, what, whatever happened to Insolia, are they still around? That's probably a question best asked to Howard. And um, uh, we could probably ask him that next week, can't we, Craig? Yeah, without, giving, without giving away what episode 50 has, has, has in store. Um, in fact, we'll maybe ask Toby to ask him himself. Um, <laughs> could, we, uh, could we also click on perineal tendinopathy, please? Um, yes. Because I think that's something that, um, again, comes a bit, I, I, assuming, I, I think I know what you're going to say, it's something that comes counterintuitive. And I remember Craig talking about the first time he had to uh, apply pronatory forces to a foot that he needed counselling afterwards. Uh, and um, I think this is one that, that I, I love talking to students about as well, because it, it, it is a bit counterintuitive. So yeah, if you don't mind going through that as well, please. Yeah, um, this is one I definitely got from Kevin. Um, but I had been thinking about it for the longest period of time because, you know, you would have these patients where you give them the orthotic and you know that they, they appear to be pronating, but they keep telling you that they feel unstable laterally. So once in a while, I would actually arch fill uh, the lateral aspect of an orthotic device, even though the patient is pronating, they felt a lot more comfortable with this lateral arch filling it. So that got me to thinking, um, and I, you know, I never really thought about the tissue stress theory at that point in time, but you know, if we're trying to take the load off of the medial side of the lower leg and the tibialis posterior and the uh, flexor muscles, why can't it be like that on the other side? So when I saw Kevin um, doing the evaluation of um, the uh, you know, supination um, moments and then the pronation moments, and then he started talking about the subtalar joint axis being deviated laterally. And I remember at a workshop that he did one time where he had somebody in the crowd and he picked out the peroneal tendons firing just because the person was uh, supinating so badly that they needed to use the peroneal muscles to give them you know, balance. So if you're using offloading or load reduction on the medial side of the leg, why can't it be done on the lateral side of the leg for the peroneal uh, musculature? So um, I have used this for the last uh, probably 15 years with uh, you know, great success. And in fact, there's a lot of times where I'll just put uh, padding underneath um, the lateral aspect of the foot um, and people are happy with that. So I'll do a prefab and then I might put a little bit of Corex down the lateral, as or the lateral aspect of the prefab and that will take away a lot of the discomfort they're feeling. They'll feel a lot more balanced. So it's probably taking the load off of the peroneal group muscles. And this is actually a article from and posture from two years ago, and they looked at the effects of a lateral uh, arch fill versus no lateral arch fill, and they looked at the effect on the muscle activity of the uh, peroneal groups, and they did notice a little bit of a difference with the lateral arch fill orthotic versus the no lateral arch fill. But you have to remember that uh, when you're looking at EMG studies, you really, really have to be careful with the uh, results of the muscle activity because it's not really rep reproducible, especially in between sessions, you know, one week to the second week to the third week. So this is basically information within one session. So um, there is no kind of like long-term effect that they've seen with the EMG, but it was just an interesting study. I would show that it does have an effect on the uh, uh, amplitude of the uh, peroneus longus muscle. Wonderful. Um, and, and lateral heel skive, you can also do a lateral heel skive if you also want to, too. Yeah, yeah, that's one of my favorites. I could talk about this stuff all night. I literally could. I, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, Craig, have we, got, have we got time for some more? Have we got time for, for one or two more? 
Sorry, yeah, we can do one more, yeah. One more. Okay, I've got to pick my favourite then. Let me take a look. Can we, can I get your take? It's on the far right column, second down on, on the bottom cover. We spend a lot of time, I think, um, focusing on the top cover and, and its its qualities, its coefficient of friction, its cushioning. And I think the bottom cover, um, certainly in the UK, sometimes gets forgotten about and ignored. So I'd love your take on, on its importance and, and, and considerations there. Okay, so which column are you looking at? So, uh, far, far right column, miscellaneous modifications, and yeah, the bottom, it's sec bottom cover. Sec uh, second from second from the top. Um, bottom second covers? one down, bottom cover. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, okay. Um, well, I tend to use bottom covers just to help and help stiffen the top covers. Just it just allows an easy transfer in and out of the work boot. Um, so. I tend to use a bottom cover, especially if you look in the case where I've done the, the cutout of the, uh, of the lesion accommodation. So it could either be capsulitis or uh, maybe there's callus or hyperkeratosis under the second metatarsal head uh, plantarly. Um, generally, if I put poron in the area where it's cut out, then I want to protect that poron. So I'll use a bottom cover. But again, if you look at the top covers, the top covers could be anything from uh, Puff, which is an EBA that's soft. It could be Spanko. Uh, it could be just vinyl. It could be vinyl and poron. It could be EVA and poron. It depends on what your aim is. Are you trying to reduce shearing? Although um, it's hard to tell whether you are reducing that shearing type of stress, but there's definitely that frictional force there. So um, I guess it's sort of like trial and error, whatever works best for your patient. But I tend to use a lot of uh, puff, which is the EVA, or I'll tend to use a lot of puff and pour on together uh, to provide a little bit of cushioning. Um, and then I use a bottom cover just to help with stability. Yeah. Yeah, I use, Ag I Agaf I, I use Agaflex an awful lot in footballers, rugby players, in, in boots. Yeah. I use a lot, a lot of Agaflex. That was a tip given to me a few years ago. Um, I've got one more, one more thing to say before Craig cuts us off. We're getting towards the hour mark, so he, he's definitely getting twitchy for sure. Um, and it's, and, and you, we don't need the matrix. You can unshare your screen if you want. Um, I'd love to go through every single thing on there, by the way, but um, clearly we don't have time. Can I, so can, I add one in there? can I just add one in there? Yeah, yeah, do, please. Uh -huh. Okay, it's just one I want to throw in there. That I want to just throw in the superthotic. That sounds very cool. Um, the superthotic is one. I mean, I I on the advisory board for Paris Orthotics, and the background of Paris Orthotics, they're located in Vancouver, BC. So um, their company started off as a shoe uh, company, and they did a lot of uh, work boots for forestry workers. So they have a lot of um, uh, experience working in people who are working in very, very extreme conditions. So this is an orthotic for, of choice for people who work in extreme conditions or so sort of mining forestry foundry. So you have a direct milled shell. You put a three millimeter top, puff, top cover to the toe, so it's an EVA. And then you put the Agriflex bottom. This orthotic is almost indestructible. <laughs> in these conditions. Just if you happen to have a patient that falls in one of these categories. That's awesome. That's awesome. Five or six years. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. So, um, hey, sorry, I thought I'd throw that one in. No, that's fine. I would happily go through every single one here, but, um, but yeah, we should, we try and keep these things to the, uh, to the hour or so. So yeah, feel free to unshare your screen because I don't, I think it's cruel leaving that up there and, I don't want, and looking at all the things that I want to talk about, but we can't. One, one last thing before we wrap up, and um, more of a personal thing, really. You may not remember this, but the last time we spoke, uh, it was actually in Canada at, at the Sheraton on the Falls at the, yep. uh, annual, at the annual conference of two years ago. And I don't know if you remember this, but you said to me that if I was ever in Toronto, that you were going to take me to a Maple Leafs game. And I just wanted to check that that, <laughs> just, I just wanted to check that, that offer was still open. And yeah, it's still can... open. Good, good. I just went. I'm going to call that. I'm going to call that in very soon. I just want to double check. Okay, okay. great. It might be easier to be actually in Montreal at a hockey game than there's Toronto. But okay, yes. <laughs> no, I think the the hour's gone. I mean, there's um, 
no other comments. There is one comment I did pick up on. I don't know whether you noticed it, Ian, but my wife actually made a comment. I did see. I did yeah, see. <laughs> she's very happy that I didn't wake her up this morning because I'm not at home doing this because we normally do the morning and disrupts the house. So I'll have to do a shout out to her. Um, yes. For those of you who joined oh. later, I'm in the same room with Peter. We're just at opposite end of the room. So look, the hour's gone quickly. So you know, th thanks so much for that, Peter. I know it's been a long day for you. I'll just turn my camera around so you can uh, wave to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we, we, I think we've actually, I don't know what's happening now, Peter. Isn't, isn't there another session and the drinks don't start till about nine o'clock or something? Um, yeah, yeah. there's a session that starts now. Yeah, yeah. okay, well, look, so, so thanks again, Peter. Um, no thanks, thanks, Peter.